grace and peace to the believers grace and peace even if you don't believe yet because the good news of the bad news of this cosmic controversy is that we have overcome in fact in our third part of this series today what we're going to talk about is the reality that the lord is with you always even unto the end he's promised this we are fighting a battle but we are fighting a battle that has already been won we're simply nearing the end of the movie and we have to believe the climax of this story so that's why we go to the climactic book the final book of the bible in revelation 12 to find our focus verse and our prayer for the day we've got to recognize lord you've told us the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of god and have the testimony of jesus christ because this is our reality but it leads us to also see our redemption in jesus name we pray amen as we embrace and attempt to to relive, relive or I should say receive there we go to receive the truth that the Lord is always with his faithful we've got to understand that rebels hate the righteous understand haters come from the hatred that began in the heart of Lucifer as we saw in yesterday's study if you haven't watched that start there because now we'll see how this spirit is being played out in people today but also how salvation is being played out in some today. Genesis 37, three, this is the story of Joseph and his brothers, seeing how the, the rebels hate the righteous. Israel, or Jacob as we call him normally, loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors, so he spoiled them. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. The love that Israel, Jacob, put on his son caused those other sons in their insecurities to question their father's love for themselves. Therefore, they hated the one who they thought was the cause of their lack of love, supposedly. If that even makes sense, and it really shouldn't make sense, but it is reality. This is why rebellers hate the righteous, because they shed light on their rebellion they shed light on their failures or shortcomings so rather than stepping up and being changed or changing they choose to take out the one who is showing or revealing their need to change it happens then and it happens now even back in jacob and esau's house when jacob was a young man and his brother esau well esau hated jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him and Esau said in his heart the days of mourning for my father at hand then will I slay my brother Jacob his hatred was so deep that he was going to wait until his father their father Isaac died and then he was going to kill him but he hated him because of the blessing rebellers hate the righteous not because of their being righteous but because of Christ's righteousness in them. We see this played over and over and even now. It says here in Mark 14, and it's different how it played out here in this story because Jesus is here and he's in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. He's sitting at meat at dinner and there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. She broke the box and poured it on his head. And so as she's blessing Jesus now, thanking him for delivering her from demonic possession and a life in rebellion, there were some that had indignation within themselves. Rebellers now hating the righteous, hating her. And they said, why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence that had been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. They murmured against her, not because of the ointment that she wasted, but her praise made their pride exposed. Her desire to surrender exposed their selfishness. So rather than surrender, get rid of her. And rather than repent, remove her. And this is why now you have this cycle that seems to pop up that whenever people make the decision to do what's right, it makes those who want it to do what's right and who know to do what's right, to do what is right, 
they seem to get harder on those people that don't want to do what's right. And then let me tell you this way. Sometimes the people who will judge you the most are not the world, but it's actually people in the church who still have the world in them. And because of their fear to fall back and their fear to do, but they still do in their desire because they have been born again, want to do what you're doing. They'll condemn you more than the worldly who's trapped in that sin too. This is why we have to be so careful to understand why people hate. Because when we understand it, we can even go back in history and see, look, this world has not changed and the spirit of rebellion is not going to change without the change of God's grace. Because history records 1260 years of what rebellion ultimately is all about. Remember how it says that what Esau wanted to do to Jacob? Remember how it says what Joseph's brothers wanted to do to him? This is what has happened in fulfillment of Revelation 12 to the believers and to the righteous all throughout history. In fact, for 1260 years, this was recorded. The Bible says that of Satan, his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven. That means one third of the angels in heaven are now demons and they were cast to this earth. And because of this, now the dragon stands before the woman, that's the church, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. This is Christ. And the church brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So now here's what's happening. This was prophesied and is fulfilled now in Revelation 12, 6, where the woman, the church, flies into the wilderness after giving birth to Christ. In other words, after Christ came and he, li he was born, he lived, he died and was resurrected. Not long after that, the woman had to flee. The church had to go into the wilderness where she hath prepared a place of God that she should feed her there. He rather that God should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. A score is 20. So one thousand two hundred and sixty days. And in prophecy, a day represents a year, a day for a year principle. So what happens now is for 1260 years, if we look back, was the church persecuted? Absolutely. In fact, Revelation 12, 14 says it in this way. To the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, a remote place where she is nourished for a time, times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Now we know who the serpent is. The serpent is Satan. And we know that a time represents one. Times is more than one or two times. That's two. So that's one plus two is three and a half. So three and a half. Well, three and a half what? Well, it's simply three and a half years. And if we understand that a day stands for a year, prophetically, three and a half years equals 1260 days. And so now, from what date to what date can we get 1,260 years or time times and a half a time? Well, historically, in the year 538 A.D., the emperor Justinian of Rome gave power, gave not just clerical or church authority, but state authority to the church. In effect, state and church were united. And when state and church were united, for 1260 years, the church had the authority of the state to mandate worship. The church at this time became and was the global Roman Catholic Church. The word Catholic itself even means global or universal. So the Roman universal church ruled the world. And for 1260 years, it separated not church and state instead it separated people from faith and now what bound the world together was a church and state that hurt that hated that persecuted the righteous like Esau like Joseph brothers and up until 1798 which was when Pope Pius was put in prison by Napoleon of France this is when this period ended so for 1260 years, the church ran the state and you see what happens when you combine the two. It happened then and it will happen anytime 
you unite church and state. And that's why it will happen again. Because as was prophesied and as I was warned, we have to remember the righteous are never left alone. Even when men decide to bring church and state back together again, the good news is just like God had faithful ones yesterday and he was with his faithful, he will be with us, in fact, even in greater glory. Because in Matthew 28, verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, this is what Jesus says. And lo, in other words, don't forget, remember and believe I am with you always even until the end of the world. This is what we're focusing on in this series. Where is Jesus at the end of the world? He's right here with us. Where is God at the end of his story? He's right here with us. In fact, by his spirit, he is even in us. In fact, we have a story in Daniel 3 where Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and he rose up in haste. This was the same king who decided he was going to unite church and state and said, you know what? I'm going to be the church. Everybody worship me. But there were three young men who said, no, we will only worship our creator, not his creation. Because of that, they were cast into the fire and they were supposed to be burned in a fire seven times hotter than it was originally set. How they did that, I don't even know how they could figure out <laughs> seven times hotter. But that's how hot it was. So when you think about it, what happened then, at the end of times, it will be, quote, seven times hotter than what they dealt with. But where is God? Well, they look in the fire. And Nebuchadnezzar says, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, O true king. And he answered and said, but lo, <laughs> Jesus said lo. But remember, Nebuchadnezzar said lo. That's why Jesus said lo. When, when, when you hear the world saying lo, Jesus said, I'm, I'm there. So when Nebuchadnezzar says lo, I see four men loose. <laughs> they were about, what that means is all the fire did was burn off the ropes that they had been bound by because there was a fourth walking in the midst of that same fire and they have no hurt. What was hurt was what they tried to bind them with. Why? Because the form of the fourth is like unto the son of God. They were on God's GPS, God's positioning satellite, and that satellite is always pointed where we are. In fact, when you go and look at Acts 7, when Stephen, when he became a martyr for the faith, when the blood of Stephen's sacrifice became the seed for Paul's resurrection, when he became born again, before he died, it says, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They gnashed on him with their teeth. Talk about hatred. These brothers were possessed. They were ready to rip this brother apart. But Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, why is that important? Because it lets us know where God was. Where was the Lord in Stephen's trial? He was in Stephen. He was filling Stephen and Stephen looks up into heaven, steadfast, <laughs> focus. He got to focus, man. His brother was so focused, he looks in heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Oh, man, this is overwhelming. And when he sees it, he says, behold, he's trying to get them to look. <laughs> you, all, you all trying to kill me? Look. I see the heavens opened and the son of man standing on the right hand of God. <laughs> he saw the father. He sees the son and the spirit is in him. He was not alone at his time of trial. We are not alone in our time of trial. So we will never be alone in any future time of trial if we believe I'm so glad that Jesus did not just lift me but sister you got to be encouraged Jesus loves you and he will not stand by and watch you go through Jesus says I will go through because that is how I will bring you through 
It's good to know that he's the fourth man in the fire. It's good to know that he is faithful when I'm falling. He is strong when I am weak. And even when I am persecuted, he is present. So brothers and sisters, the dragon was wroth with the woman and he still is. He went to make war with the remnant of his seed and he still is. But here's the question. Are we still intending, focusing, trusting to keep the commandments of God and having the testimony of Jesus Christ, faith in Christ, that he will never leave us? If you were blessed by this video, praise Jesus and be sure to like, share and subscribe. There is much more to see and learn on our website at changeministry.org. If you feel impressed, we would really appreciate any gift that you can give towards our work. Just click the donate tab on the page and your support will help us grow as you grow.